Hi everyone. So this is the lecture on the genus Homo. Um, so if you were looking at the syllabus, you probably noticed um, that there we were doing, I think I split this up over two days. Um, like at least, you know, because there's always a little leeway with the syllabus. Um, and also, maybe you noticed that on the syllabus I had marked down that I was going to be at a conference like next week. Obviously, that's not happening. All the major uh, conferences got canceled, so I won't be um, out of town. Um, so what I'm probably going to end up doing is, since this PowerPoint is a bit long, I'll probably split it up into three parts instead of two. Um, and to kind of make up for that day. Although, like, I mean... I doubt you guys are all logging in on like exactly Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm assuming. I, I mean, I can kind of see when the views are happening that you're waiting to the weekend or whatnot. And that's obviously totally fine, that's up to you. Um, but just for, for the sake of not having any super long videos or lectures, um, so it's easier for you, easier for me, I'm probably gonna, like I said, split this up into three sections instead of two. Um, but I'm not like moving any assignments up or anything. Okay, so hopefully you all watched the video I posted on the research paper. Um, the guidelines for that are in Canvas under files. It should, it, it'll be very obvious. It'll be right there. Um, I feel like the written instructions are fairly self-explanatory. However, I did post that, that quick video for you guys to, to kind of get a little more detail from me. But obviously, um, if you want to reach out to me for clarification on anything, please, please do that. <clears throat> Um, and just to reiterate uh, what I said before in the other video, you get to pick what any you you pick which it, oh my god you get to pick any topic that you want as long as it's something we've either talked about already or will talk about. So if you're looking at the book, um, or if you're looking at the syllabus, anything that we've talked about or will talk about in this class is 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 totally up to you. So pick something that's going to be interesting to you because you're going to be writing uh, you know a, a short but you're gonna be writing a, a research paper on it. So pick something that kind of popped out to you that was interesting that we already learned or maybe something coming up that you find interesting. Okay, anyway, so so um, actually to, to the PowerPoint. So it's the PowerPoint titled The Genus Homo. Um, it's like 62 slides, it's quite long. Like I said, I'm gonna split this up into probably at least three videos. So we'll just start with um, how we've done this before. So we have slide number one, that's the title slide. Um, slide two. Okay, so the genus Homo. So all these, uh, the previous videos, the previous lectures that we've had have been talking about the paranthropines, the australopithecines, um, even those early genera in, in um, uh, hominins. So like, if you recall, like Sahelanthropus, Aurora, and all those. So we've been going, you know, in time, like from about six million years ago, you know, like five million, four million. And so now we're getting even more recent in time. And now we're talking about our genus, the genus Homo. Um, so we are, of course, you know, Homo sapiens. Um, so now we're talking about our specific genus. So we've um, talked about those other ones, those um, uh, other genera we talked about more recently, Australopithecines and Paranthropines, the differences between those two. And so now we're kind of looking at, okay, as this general lineage is, is evolving and progressing, like what are the differences we're, not, we're seeing now with the genus Homo? So the first slide is just going over that. So how can Homo um, as a genus be differentiated from the Australopithecines? So the previous group we had discussed. So there's just some general bullet points here. So larger brain size, so brains are getting bigger at this point. Um, the skull is even rounder, so we're starting to see even a slightly uh, um, a slight change in the actual shape of the skull. Um, smaller faces, so this is a general trend. Brains get a little bigger, faces get a little smaller. We see this trend throughout the whole lineage in general, but we definitely start to see a lot of those shifts happening right around um, in, in the beginning of and throughout our genus. Um, less prognathism, recall that prognathism is like projection out of the face. Typically around the mouth, we consider like that's prognathic, uh, like a snout in the nose area. Um, we're not really seeing that. We start to see that like decreasing and decreasing and decreasing throughout this lineage. And of course, like no cresting, like we saw with the paranthropines, no cresting at all. Um, so those are some general ways you can tell the difference between um, Homo and, and Australopithecines. Okay. So the next slide, slide three, you'll see a nice little uh, timeline that I created, you know, multiple... Uh, uh, pictures like this throughout these these um, slides. Um, this is just so you have a, a very general um, um, guideline for 
and a reference that we're moving in, in time. So we talked about those early genera, then we talked about Oscar with the disease and paranthropines, now we're moving into the genus Homo, which includes us, so this is much more, more recent in the timeline, more, all the stuff that's kind of happening now in the last like two million years, three million, but we're gonna talk about that. Okay, so early species. So the book might give you, I'm sure, um, quite a few, but for this lecture and for the class for the exam, I only want you to focus on, for the, at least for early Homo, we're only gonna focus on Homo habilis and Homo erectus. Those are the only two. Um, so you'll see in this picture, it's just a bullet point with those two names, and then you'll see a skull. Um, that's a skull of Homo erectus. So I know you might have to think, okay, what do the other skulls look like? You might have to refer back to the other PowerPoints, but just kind of imagine that, um, and, and I have some comparisons coming up too, but, You'll start to notice this trend, like I said, of the brains are getting bigger. We start to see this being really important around this time. Okay, so the next slide, Homo habilis versus Homo rudolfensis. So right away, you're like, wait a minute, I thought we were only talking about Homo habilis and Homo erectus, what's rudolfensis, what's going on? So I wanted to kind of start out with this right away and say, the book might, like I said, give you many more species, um, but I really am gonna focus on just habilis and erectus. However, I wanna focus on some of the controversies and there are many in paleoanthropology, and there are many that kind of happen around, uh, or focused on like our genus, genus Homo. Um, oh God, I slipped right past that. Okay. Um, so if you're looking at the slide Homo habilis versus Homo rudolfensis, the, the controversy I wanna get at for this is that there is debate whether this is one species or two. Um, there's a picture and you'll see the two skulls, like the two type specimens for Habilis and Rudolfensis uh, compared to each other. Um, some people, we talked about this before, lumpers versus splitters. So lumpers might say it's all one species. There's probably, yeah, they look different, but there's probably just some uh, natural variation. That could be maybe we're seeing sexual dimorphism. Maybe we're just seeing it's the same species, but the females are smaller, males are bigger. Like absolutely this happens sometimes in, in primates in nature. Um, we know that's a thing. Um, others would say no, like they're, they're too different. I don't think we're seeing male, female. I don't think we're seeing just general variation. I think that these are two distinct groups. Those would be the splitters. They would say, no, I think we're looking at two actually like separate species. So just know like there's kind of this debate going on or well, like sort of. Uh, if you go to the next slide, slide six, it kind of elaborates more on this and it's showing you another picture side by side of Habilis versus Rudolfensis and looking at these two um, and the, hold on, let me, let me just check something real quick. Okay, good, okay. Um, and so just, like I said, kind of reiterating the, the points of this debate, like is it one species with variation or maybe dimorphism, is it two? Um, and so, the interesting thing. So if you look at this, these pictures that I've showed you, it's kind of you're looking at you know like a, a two-dimensional picture. But um, so it's kind of hard to see all the little details. But I'll just you know tell you. And in class, I would ask like, does anyone notice anything interesting? Um, you only have a few pictures to notice anything, but you can still kind of see. And if you go back and forth between slide five and slide six, hopefully these things kind of pop out to you. If it were just a single species that's highly sexually dimorphic. Um, where the female is the smaller one, the male is the larger one. There's something not quite right that doesn't quite fit because if you're looking at slide five, you'll see that side by side, that like side view of Rudolfensis and Habilis, that it's the smaller one that has the more robust or masculine features. So recall when we talked about like uh, gorillas or orangutans and those difference between, or macaques, we talked about the difference, the sexual dimorphism where the, like the bone structure is, is much more robust or larger in the male, more cresting for muscle attachment because the muscle, um, the muscles are bigger. Um, if that's the case, what we're seeing here isn't really that because it's the smaller one that has the more robust features. So the story of it possibly being one species with just a lot of dimorphism doesn't really work. Um, and so you might say, oh, okay, well, maybe it's just one species, um, but uh, there's just um, like a lot of variation. However, if you start really looking, and it's, like I said, it's kind of hard to see this in the pictures, but if you, if you really can, like, if you take the lab course, you'll have some casts and you can really see this in detail because you'll be able to hold the skull in your hand. Um, that there are a lot of morphology, like especially in, in the facial region, it just doesn't, it's more than variation. And I would say that many paleoanthropologists would say 
this is probably two separate species. Like there's enough going on that we should split them into two. So, so just understand there's, there's debate. Um, back and forth. This happens a lot in our field. Okay, so moving on. So, but but now just to focus on Homo habilis. So now we're on slide seven. Um, so you'll see once again one of these really interesting Smithsonian recreations of um, the species um, looking a little more. What's the word? Like you might, if you saw a picture, you might be, you might think, oh, okay, like that could be related to us. So it's starting to look more like familiar. Um, not that there's, remember, there's no goal in evolution. There's no goal for it to get to a human or a Neanderthal or anything. But when we're looking at it, we want to, like, we use ourselves as a reference point. It, it's interesting to kind of see, like, oh, okay, that looks kind of familiar. Okay, so now we see a big jump in brain size. Remember that for the brains in the early genera and um, Australopithecines, even preanthropines, we weren't really seeing anything past 500 cc's. And now we're starting to see a jump in that parabolic dental arch so this is related remember to the base is getting smaller so it's still the same number of teeth teeth are smaller a little bit but they all have to kind of fit in there so we see this nice you know parabolic uh, dental arch so we're really starting to see that brain vault is a little more rounded so if you look at this top picture we don't have like a modern forehead like a nice straight vertical forehead but there's a little bit a little bit of a forehead forming not much but a little bit and, and definitely different from what we had seen in, in the in the previous species so we are seeing a bit difference there um but then okay so look at the last bullet point though should homo habilis be included in the genus homo so you might be thinking well i don't understand we call it homo habilis well i don't understand the question you know but remember that you know, species aren't born with a label. When we find a fossil, it's not like this is the species. Like remember that the species, the idea of species is, is a human concept. Like we are um, kind of trying to organize. Now does nature kind of organize itself in similar ways? Absolutely. Um, but we still get those occasional ones where we're like, okay, it seems as if nature's kind of putting these in a group. This one kind of fits, kind of doesn't. And that's fine because that's how nature works. But we still in our minds are like, okay, let's try to fit it into one of these groups or not. And, and sometimes we get it wrong. Like sometimes we're like, okay, you know, we thought this worked and it doesn't. And, and you know, we're, we're, we're doing this in terms of like our own field in science and paleoanthropology. Like we're trying to fit everything in these boxes, um, which has complete validity to it. Uh, but sometimes you get the occasional one like Havilis where you're not, it doesn't quite fit. And people will disagree on how it should fit or where it should fit. Um, so just know that's, that this is a, a debate about Homo habilis, a little bit more of a recent debate. Um, because before it seemed as if Homo habilis was clearly different from the Australopithecines, that we see a jump in brain size, um, we see the first evidence of tool use, um, we see a lot of major differences that make it seem like, no, this is definitely a separate genera than what we had seen before. Um, however, when you look at, and you'll start to see this as we go through these different species, when you look at all of uh, the Homo genus, and the different species as a group, Homo habilis is kind of an outlier in a lot of different important things, and we'll talk about those. Um, but then you might say, okay, well, sure, because it's the first one, there's not gonna be some major jump. But it's just, it's one of those things when you look at, you know, Australopithecines as a group and you look at Homo as a group, habilis, to many people, they would say it fits more in with the Australopithecines in many different ways. So keep that in mind as we go through all of these different um, homo uh, species, that habilis is kind of the odd one out, and that might be okay to you. You might say there's never gonna, they're all not gonna be exactly the same. Um, but if you're if you're thinking about what we talked about, be about before with uh, that difference between cladistics and uh, evolutionary taxonomy, this might be one of those really important groups where you would say no, like you're gonna see a lot of dis disagreement because of how you're understanding how they fit. Okay. Um, so the next slide, slide eight. Just another uh, simplified timeline, just so you have a nice visual. Like I said before, I like to see a visual timeline. It makes things a lot easier in my mind. So I'm assuming you guys probably want something similar. So if you're looking at this picture, you'll see that uh, the paranthropines, you know, obviously like they were an offshoot. We talked about that before, they all died out. And we have the aust australopithecines eventually evolving into um, these early homo uh, species. Next species, Homo erectus. So you see that nice uh, picture of the Smithsonian recreation. So this one as well, you might, if you looked at that, it has something familiar to it. Like you would say, huh, that does kind of look similar to us as humans, like clearly different, but not so different. 
not like looking at a human versus a chimpanzee where you would say okay like we're kind of sort of related that looks seems obvious but not close like not recently um versus when you look at homo habilis or homo erectus you're like okay this isn't you know six million years like it is with chimps this is like you know two three like it's much you see a lot more similarities so it's really interesting to see these recreations okay so 1.8 million years ago give or take um east africa and then out this is important so i know i told you before that i will never ask you the locations like to me like i know a lot of other professors will make you memorize that and to me it ends up being one of those things that you memorize and forget right away um however considering homo erectus it's important to know that it is the first one to as far as what the evidence is indicating now homo erectus is the first homo species to leave africa before whether we were talking about central africa africa or east africa or south africa um homo erectus is the first one to leave africa they exist in africa and outside so this is really really important in terms of like you know, migration and, and evolution of, of these different species that come after. So just remember that Homo erectus, as far as we know with the evidence so far, it's the first one to leave Africa. Um, so the first specimen was discovered by Eugene Dubois. So recall that we had talked about Raymond Dart before with the Australopithecines and uh, like many, many scientists, you know, they had this idea like, okay, clearly humans are probably related to apes like gorillas or chimps or orangutans, but they had no, they, like we, now we have so many fossils. But at the time, they didn't have anything, so they were just going off, you know, like their what what little information they had, and and you know their experience as, as scientists. But you, you know, it's not they, they got a lot of it wrong. Um, and then you have these scientists like Dart and Dubois, who were like, I think maybe something's going on here, and a lot of times what they have to say is disregarded. Anyway, so Dubois was convinced that we were more closely related to orangutans. And so because orangutans are in Asia, he thought he would find like more like human ancestral stuff in Asia. So he went to Asia. Now he got, he kind of got it wrong, but kind of got it right at the same time. Um, so we're more closely related to chimpanzees, but we do have some ancestral stuff in, in Asia, Homo erectus um, for one. Um, so he was not completely wrong. Anyway, so he found, um, what's called a skull cap. So if you're looking at that picture on top, you'll see like the darker shaded part of the skull. So like imagine like just that part, um, but enough to be able to tell this is some large brained biped. Um, and just like with what Dart had, he's like, this is like a large brain biped. Um, and people like other scientists, the community in general was like, no, you're wrong, you know. And Eugene Dubois dedicated a, a huge part of his life, you know, um, moved, himself and his family. I think that's on the next slide. Let's see. Oh, it's not. I think I have him coming up later. Oh, I think I do. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I'll, I'll pause my comments on Eugene Dubois because I think I have a couple slides about him. Anyway, okay, so um, moving on to slide 10. Some characterizing features of Homo erectus. So here you can see another picture. One of the things you should hopefully notice is that that brow ridge, so that that bone across the top of the eyes is very prominent in Homo erectus. Very prominent. This is a, a characterizing feature. Like many of these species will have it to some degree, but in Homo erectus, it tends to be very unique looking. Um, we also have a much larger brain now. So now we're at a thousand cc, so a big jump with Homo erectus. Um, and they have very thick cortical bone. Now I know we didn't talk about cortical versus uh, trabecular bone. Um, in when we talked about the human skeletal stuff but if you if you had the lab already hopefully you got a, a lot of information about this um but i'll just give you the quick rundown so if you're thinking about a bone um like your femur um that bone is not solid bone throughout there's a really thick outer bone or cortical bone and then the more like um porous bone inside um that's called the trabecular or cancellous bone um the cortical bone, so that outside more thick part for Homo erectus is, is distinguishable. Like it's much thicker than we see in any other species, uh, any other Homo species, so it stands out. Um, they also have a, what's called a sagittal keel. So remember that we talked about the sagittal crest for the paranthropines. Um, sagittal crest is that extra, and like we talked about it with the other primates too, like gorillas and stuff. 
or they have that extra bone coming up here for those muscles to attach. Like the, the body has to create more bone because the muscles are so big it needs extra bone to attach to. So that's not what this is. It's in that same place along the sagittal suture, but it's called a sagittal keel. And if you're looking at this picture, you'll see it's just a nice little raised bump area, but it kind of runs along that whole area here. What that ends up doing, it's not for muscle attachment. It basically serves as a way to absorb stress that might be the body might be encountering either in the head or the face. And this is also attributed to like that thick cortical bone. There's something interesting going on with Homo erectus that the bone structure is so interesting and unique. Really thick cortical bone, this thick prominent brow ridge, that sagittal keel, also a nuchal torus and also in the back area. There's a lot of bone that seems to be for stress absorb shock absorption stress ab absorption um so just interesting to think about what's going on in the daily lives of, of homo erectus okay so the next slide tricana boy slide 11. um so this is one of the a very famous specimen that we have for homo erectus um what we can tell why it's important is that we can tell that uh, some of the growth trajectories for the species. So when we're looking at this individual, we can tell okay, they were probably approximately this age. It's interesting to compare those types of growth trajectories to like modern humans to kind of just look at the evolution of that. Um, but also it's like fairly complete. So recall that we had Lucy who was 40% complete and because we can mirror left to right, we can we had like almost eight, like around 80% of her. But for Turcombo, we actually have 80%. We have almost an entire skeleton. This is very rare. It's an amazing find. Um, and what they were they were able to tell so many interesting things about this individual like that in 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 adulthood They probably would have been close. I think it's like to like five 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 ten or five eleven some like like a modern height um, So that's interesting to think about all of those australopithecines were, were quite short um, So now we're starting to see this jump in stature, you know brain size really interesting stuff with homo erectus Okay, so um slide 12 um, Java man. So you'll see, so uh, skull cap, this is what I was talking about before. Um, a nice picture of that. Let's see. Uh, Jukudian for slide 13. These are just some interesting types, uh, some interesting specimens and some interesting sites you can kind of see as we go through these. Okay, I want to get to, this is what I want to get to, slide 14. So Eugene Dubois. Um, so like I said, he was the one to find the first Homo erectus. This was, you know, in 1891. Um, he, like I said, so it's here, he thought we were more closely related to the Asian apes. Um, so he was determined to find something in Asia. Um, so slide, let's go to slide 15. So he um, moves there with his wife and his uh, child. They find the skull cap and he's like, he's so excited. He's telling everyone, oh my God, we found something. Like I knew it, I knew we were gonna find something in Asia. Um, and people don't really believe him at first. So like, oh, this is probably just like, some ancestral gibbon and he's like no it's not like this is a biped for sure um so i think oh yeah that's on the slide so he and his family end up getting malaria because he's like he keeps going back and he stays there for a long time and and they end up getting malaria and like they're fine and then i think like there's there's a other story where like people who were helping on the expedition end up like stealing all his equipment and like abandon him like it's this crazy story um because, you know, but, but it's also like this really cool like adventure, like paleoanthropology story, like Eugene Dubois was like determined to find something and he did. And, and unfortunately he never really found anything else. I think he found like a, oh, I should know. I think he found like a tibia or something. But what he found was so important because later on other scientists came along and were like, something's going on here. And later we're like, oh, it's a species called Homo erectus. And they were a little bit later species. They weren't like early ancestors, but they were clearly here. They're in, all these parts of the world that we didn't know before um so just like raymond's art um you know unappreciated in their time but later we realize these these major contributions they made to the field so okay um slide 17. so you'll see wait no i'm sorry slide 16. slide 16 sorry so you'll see um i have this homo erectus versus homo ergaster um so the book goes into this a little bit, and this is just one of those other controversies, well, not really controversial, but depending on who's teaching you, depending on what book you're reading, you might get a different story. So sometimes you'll see that if it's if it's this group, if they're in Asia, they're called Erectus, if they're in Africa, they're called Orgaster. Sometimes, 
like myself and the way I learned it and the way I teach it is we lump them into one species. It's one species, it's Homo erectus. We're gonna see slight variation because of the geography is a little different. So we're gonna see slight, slightly different adaptations to that geography. But I would say it's not enough to give them a different species. Like they're still the same species with just some interesting variation because of geography. Um, but if you ever see Homer or Gaster, you, you, that, just so you know, like it's, it's Homo erectus, same thing. Okay, slide 17, old wand tools. I think, I don't know, we didn't talk about this. Okay, so, okay, I did mention Homo habilis is the first species, as far as we know, evidence later could show that that's not uh, the whole story. This is how science works. But as far as what we know now, Homo habilis is the first homo, uh, hominid species to use tools. Um, we have named those tools old wand tools. We call them like simple tools, but this is important. These tools worked really well for a really long time. As for Homo habilis, they needed something basic, simple, because they only needed to use it for that purpose. They didn't have any complex thing they were trying to accomplish. Um, so their tool worked really well um, and it worked for a long time. You can see in this picture the way that they um, made this tool. You have like a core stone, a hammer stone, and you're basically trying to get these flakes off that you, you can like sharp, sharp pieces of, of rock that you can then use later maybe to cut into things. Um, but not very complex in the process. A lot of, you know, hammering into each other, you get some pieces, you might shape them a little bit, but you're basically just trying to get these, these pieces off um, that you can use, that are gonna be useful. Nothing super complex about that. And we see these tools associated with Homo habilis. The next slide, slide 18. This is in contrast to, for Homo erectus, what's called Acheulean tools. And you can see just on this picture alone, something much more complex going on with the Acheulean tools and Homo erectus. So this is, once again, these interesting differences between Homo habilis and Homo erectus, not the separating um, in evolutionary time, like it's not a lot of time between these two, but there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. It's very different. This huge jump, this huge leap between habilis and erectus. Hence, why some people would say habilis just doesn't seem to quite fit with the other species of homo for, for morphological reasons, for cultural reasons, like they just seem very different. So if you're looking at this picture, um, the Acheulean tool, there's much, it's much more complex. It requires what we call a mental template. So if I asked you, I needed you to design a tool and it needs to look like this and I give you a bunch of specifications, you would, as I'm describing this to you, you would start to develop a picture in your mind and you would hold that picture in your mind while, it, while you made this tool. Um, there's a goal you have in your head of what you want it to look like and you're working towards that over the course of hours, if not even days. That's much different from taking two rocks you know, pounding them together to get a couple of sharp flakes. Now, for habilis, it does not imply that they were not intelligent. It does not imply, this is so important, it does not imply that they could not have made a more complex tool. That's not what that means. For homo habilis, they had a simple tool because they had a simple thing that they had to accomplish. Like, they didn't need anything more complex. Could they have made something more complex? Their brains were pretty big. They probably could have. They didn't need to. For whatever reason, we see a shift with Homo erectus. They're doing something more complex. They need a more complex tool, if that makes sense to you. So it has nothing to do with level of intelligence. It has nothing to do with ability. Now we'll never really know unless we have like a habilis brain. Um, but based on what we do know, they probably had the mental ability to, to do this. They just didn't really need to. Um, how many of you have heard of the expression, the necessity is the mother of invention? Um, so this is true, whether we're talking about, you know, humans or human ancestors, this is true. Okay, so slide 19, scavenging versus hunting. So this is all very important. So this is where we get at, like, why we see those differences. Now, before, when we talked about the Australopithecines, they were all eating plants, whether it was fruit or nuts or seeds or whatever. Plants, plants, plants. We start to see a transition with Homo habilis. As far as what we know, Homo habilis, they were scavengers. Now in class, if we were in class, I would ask you, what's the difference between a passive scavenger, an active scavenger, and a hunter? 
and usually some of them to get it right, but obviously we're not in class, so I'll tell you. So uh, a passive scavenger is an animal who waits for another animal to kill something. Then that animal like gets everything it wants, and then whatever's left, that passive scavenger will eat. So let's say like a lion came along and killed a zebra, and then the lion's eating all the really good parts, you know, all the muscle tissue, um, and what's left over might be, you know, bones, um, maybe a little muscle, probably some fat, um, but most of the good stuff is already gone. And the scavenger, the passive scavenger, will take that and use that. Now, as far as what we know, Homo habilis was a passive scavenger. They would get these leftovers. Um, but there's still some, could be, some nutritional stuff in that, um, you know, carcass, what's left over. One very important thing is bone marrow. And this is what we're pretty sure that they were using these old one tools was to break open those bones to get to the bone marrow. So they had a simple task and needed a simple tool to do that. Um, but now introducing bone marrow into the diet is so important because now you're getting um, a, you're getting a little bit of protein, but you're getting fat um, in this bone marrow. This is really important. And they're probably getting a little bit of meat that's left over muscle, but, but not a lot. So it's really the bone marrow that's very important. And this is also important. They are still eating all of that uh, plant food. They're still getting all of that really ne necessary glucose from like fruit and stuff. So it's important to have that. Um, but with Homo erectus, now we see this jump to hunting. So at some point there was a transition from, from passive scavenging to active scavenging. Active scavenging is when you still wait for the other animal to kill the animal, but then you find a way to, to get the animal to run away. So maybe you wait for the lion to kill a zebra, and then once the zebra's dead, you know, less effort for you. You're not the one having to put in all the effort to like hunt it and kill it. Um, but then you find a way to basically get the lion to leave, maybe because you're an intelligent um, primate, you maybe use, um, you know, some kind of tool, something to throw at it. Um, and now you have access to the majority of this, of this, of this dead zebra or whatever animal it is. You have access to all that great stuff. Um, and so, and then, and then of course, after that comes, comes actual hunting where you can um, coordinate strategies. Um, this is very important because we see this jump not only in the, the tools that are going to be used, the tools used for breaking open bones to get to bone marrow versus the tools used for hunting animals and processing them are going to be much different, which is why we see this huge difference in Old Awan versus the Shulian tools, Homo habilis versus Homo erectus, the tools. But also there's something else going on culturally and cognitively. The amount of communication, this is so important, communication, communication. The amount of communication that you have to have as a group to be able to hunt versus what you have to have to be able to passive scavenge is very different. And so this is why we think maybe language first started developing around Homo erectus. Um, this huge shift in what's going on with them behaviorally, culturally, with this transition to hunting. Now I want to point this out because I get this sometimes in class. People will say, we only have big brains because we started eating meat. This is not correct. This is not correct. There is so much more to the story. Think about all of the animals in the world who eat only meat. They do not have big brains. That's not, it's not a simplified story that way. It has, to, there's something else going on. Now, do we need protein um, to power big brains? That's part of the story. We also need glucose and we also need fat. Um, so it, so for, for in our lineage, there was this perfect storm of, we're getting all this glucose from the fruits and other plants. We're getting you know fat from bone marrow. We're now we're getting a little bit of protein in the meat. Um, uh, more protein than, than we were getting before. Um, and now it's this perfect combination of things that we need to power a larger brain. And, and now because we're eating those items and now because we having a big brain is actually adaptive and useful because we're using it for these hunting strategies, we're going to see this evolution of this bigger brain. Now that is very different from imagining like in the modern world, we have access, like we have a very globalized economy. We have access to all of these different foods. You do not have to be a meat eater to have to be an intelligent person like that should be no surprise to you guys you can get everything you need in the world um or because we live in a very globalized world you can get everything you need from a plant-based diet 
This is because you can just walk into the supermarket and get um, an amazing source of protein from beans and legumes. You don't need the meat. Um, but in the past, obviously Homo erectus, Homo habilis weren't working into the, walking into the grocery store. Um, so it's very different. So, but, but also keep in mind, like I said, it's not as simple as suddenly we were eating meat, we got big brains. It's not that simple. We had to have that combination of all those really important sources of fat, of glucose, and protein to, to be able to do that. So that's what I'm kind of getting out of this slide. And I think that's, yeah, okay. So I'm gonna stop here for the first part. So this is, I think I'm gonna do the first of three uh, for this section. Um, so that was the first one and uh, I'll talk to you guys later.